uh, I would like to talk about where code gets injected uh, into what ends up as a Debian package. If you're not, if you're not the author of the package, obviously the upstream is sold. Uh, Hello. Okay. So, if you are not authoring the package yourself, there is an upstream source which injects code into your package from time to time whenever you make releases. Uh, potentially, Potentially, you could also have patches that are maintained by a third party upstream. Uh, in terms of the Linux kernel, think of Linus's tree versus uh, the MM tree, for example. In each one of these cases, you are not in control of the code that is being injected into the package. Next, you might actually have one or more features that you are implementing in your package which have not yet been accepted upstream. And finally, the other major chunk of code that ends up in your package comes in from your packaging approach. There are maintainer scripts, there are often helper tools that the maintainer scripts use that get injected in here. Uh, I separate out the Debian packaging stuff from the other sources of code because usually the De your Debian packaging across several packages has more in common with each other than it does with any of the upstream. For example, every single one of your dot slash Debian directory has a file called root, which is a make file if you're following policy. It implements certain targets that policy defines. <laughs> so just by itself, you have got a great deal of commonality between Debian directories in different packages. Uh, maintainer scripts, no matter what format you represent them in, I've seen you know, postint, dot in, and so on for people who use autocon. In any case, no matter which format you use, across packages you're probably going to uh, represent your maintainer scripts in a similar fashion. I myself find my, uh, myself using a skeleton maintainer file and then which handles <coughs> all the uh, optional parameters that maintainer scripts are supposed to handle and then I go on from there making it, you know, configuring it for this specific package. So, corresponding to each one of these Put flow paths, there are certain use cases, things that you have to do during the course of maintaining packages or okay. So, to start with, since we are talking about version control systems, you've got to take your uh, upstream source and various different features and patches, etc., and put them in version control. Uh, the, once you have done that, you've got to incorporate new upstream code as releases are made. Uh, from time to time, there might be major upstream version changes. This is significant in a couple of ways. Uh, firstly, you might, depending on how widely deployed your package is and what kind of package it is, you might find the need to have two major versions in Debian at the same time. So whatever workflow and version control mechanisms you use need to cater to the possibility of having more than one version of the package in the at the time. Uh, the other thing you need to track is if you are maintaining your own patch sets and you submit them upstream and they incorporate it, you 
no longer have to separately maintain, however, <coughs> as a branch or however you are representing that feature. If you are uh, letting, if you are also incorporating a third-party maintained patch set, then whenever they re release a new patch, maybe in uh, response to a new upstream version, or maybe they have redone their patch. <coughs> you've got to be able to take that new injection of code and integrate that into your package. Uh, the same thing applies to if you continue hacking on the feature that you're maintaining, uh, or if you make changes to the Debian package. I also like to be able to uh, maintain support for stable versions of my package. So whenever Debian testing freezes, I freeze that particular branch or that particular set of packages, or repository for all my packages and move on to new ones. I, can, I like to be able to make it so that people who are following my code, my packages through the uh, distributed repository that I use, they know that this part has been frozen and the minute they try to either import or commit to it, they are told that please don't commit here, please commit to the, you know, instead of committing to edge, please commit to learning from now on. Uh, so this was the, my contribution to the theoretical part of packaging Debian. All right, and uh, I'll go somewhere entirely different and uh, talk about modern version control systems. Just give a short introduction so that we all are on the same page talking about it. Um, my template can't take a second name. I'm sorry, Manoj. That's why it's only me on there. I have to fix that. OK. Um, you've all, who of you has used distributed version control systems? Oh, dear. OK. I hope I'm not going to uh, say anything wrong now, then. Well, anyway, they are uh, considered to be hip these days. Everybody kind of uses them. And uh, uh, what I want to isolate now is actually which feature of these distributed version control systems is what makes them so useful, specifically to Debian packaging, because it's not really the distributed feature. It is just that the features that we actually want um, happen to be implemented very well in all the distributed version control systems. But uh, I want to untie that. So I'll be uh, looking a little bit here at the cleaning up the mess, what is a snapshot versus commit-based version control system, and also um, then, of course, talk about centralized versus distributed. So here is a brief overview over the evolution of version control. We all, we all kind of started out with SCCS, RCS, on the far left, centralized, file-based, no branching whatsoever, and then uh, went over to uh, the point here, big keeper, git, and Mercurial, BZR, and Monotone, which are very distributed atomic and uh, have proper branching models. I'm sorry, this uh, microphone doesn't really like me. I hope you don't mention Arch in that. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> there wasn't enough space. <laughs> Where would it be? Um, I, I, would, I would assume it's probably the where right around where Darks is. It's probably not in the BitKeeper git Mercurial BZR um, thing because it does actually, uh, well, it, it was there way before these were. So uh, it, it has some concepts that these other version control systems didn't incorporate. <laughs> and um, so it probably doesn't go into the same group. But it's also not Darks. But it would be like right around there. I mean, I'm not, I'm really not trying to say that. Arch is inferior by not including it here. We've probably all used Arch. My only beef with Arch is that I have to type so many hyphens that my hyphen key fell off. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, it's been, uh, been quite powerful. And uh, as a matter of fact, what we're talking about today is sort of uh, using branching for Debian packaging. That, that is all Manor's framework. And I, at one point in time, found Manor's page when he was doing everything in Arch because I thought it was a really cool concept. I forced myself to learn Arch, and then uh, eventually gave up, but uh, <laughs> that's just my limitation. So 
we had on the left side, we had the CVS like version control systems. And uh, what these are is uh, conceptually, I mean, I, I'm not, there are people who actually do version control systems for a living and they can prove to you mathematically that everything what, what happens is uh, sound and so on and so forth. Um, and there are people who do this academically and they have the proper terms for everything. Uh, I do neither. So I just kind of use the terms that seem normal to me. And when I say snapshot based, then some people will say that no CVS was never snapshot based and SVN is, but BZR is not and so on and so forth because it's probably a very overloaded term. But let's say it is conceptually snapshot based, a revision control system that maintains a certain state of a tree at any point in time. And if you go between revisions, you are essentially jumping between different snapshots of a tree, between different states of a tree at the point in time when these revisions were committed. Um, these can be actually change set centric, which is uh, what SVN is doing. So with SVN, a commit is actually a change set. And what the change set is trying to suggest here is that it's a collection of multiple changes that all go in together, either all or none. Unlike CVS where there aren't any change sets, there's really only divs to single uh, files, and they don't all have to go in together. So uh, <coughs> merging here consists of compu computing divs between two different revisions or snapshots and applying those, and then relying basically on the powers of the patch utility to uh, find the proper insertion points for patches and uh, you will have to resolve mer uh, conflicts yourself in the end. And another important thing is that a commit to any of these CVS, SVN like uh, version control systems is really just adding a log message to a div, in a sense. Uh, whether it's a div or a snapshot, what you can do is you can add a log message. But that log message is free form text, so it contains stuff that you as the developer find useful at a very high level, but it doesn't really contain any information that the version control system can use to identify this change or this current snapshot. How about the revision number? How about the revision? Number. Yeah, and the question was how about the revi revision number? Well, that's true, you can, you can identify the revision um, as a snapshot or a change by a revision number, but you may have made multiple changes between, and also, as soon as you start branching, then uh, I'll, I'll get to an example where this should be illustrated. I may not have perfectly explained what I mean with that, but uh, I'll have a little bit of a graph that should illustrate it better. Um, but maybe it's also going to be a little clearer if I end with this slide, if I'm done with this slide, uh, where I talk about modern version control systems, and note that I'm not saying distributed here, because none of this, I think, what I'm saying here is actually of distributed nature. But what happens is that these distributed version control systems actually are so-called commit-based. So there is not really a single snapshot of any tree at any point in time. Your tree is the function of whatever the base was that you started, plus the set of all the commits that you have applied. So I cannot say um, revision 517 on last Friday, 2200 hours, was this and that tree, because I may have pulled in a couple of patches just before that point in time, and Manoj may have pulled in these patches just two seconds after that, so at that given point in time, my tree contained the patches, Manoj's tree didn't contain the patches yet, and yet um, we are at the same point in time, we are sort of speaking about the same revision. It doesn't work that way. What is more the case is that uh, a tree is actually identified, identified by the set of commits that it contains. And merging different trees simply consists of computing the dissection of the sets of commits that have been applied to both trees, identifying which ones in the other tree are not already in my own tree, and then only taking those commits and applying them. So, Sorry for the German on there, I couldn't be bothered to remake the slides from a previous time. <coughs> but uh, basically this is what's happening uh, with these modern version control systems. Every square that you have here is a repository and those little black boxes are supposed to be commits. And what these distributed version control systems, I did display it a little bit distributed here, you can see there's no centralized entity. Um, what they require is that you can freely pass 
patches in between. So you'll see that if the top um, developer has made a change that gets pulled in by the other one, but not by the one at the bottom, the version control system still maintains consistency across all of this. And this is uh, opposed to centralized version control, which is CVS and SVN especially, where everything happens in a centralized repository and everyone, every one of the uh, developers has to check out and commit to, check out from and commit to that repository. Now, interestingly, and that's part of the reason why I'm actually trying to avoid saying distributed version control system, it's because very few people actually use distributed version control systems in a distributed way. Who of you uses ADM with distributed version control systems? Okay, and who of you uses um, distributed version control systems without any form of centralized server? All right, that's about one one. One to one mapping, okay. I expected it to be somewhat different because, uh, well, Git is one of the modern version control systems and it was developed by Linus, who uh, has an immense amount of experience with the Linux, Linux kernel. And Git provides two workflow models. One of them is the completely distributed, everything like kind of flows here and there, there is no centralized entity, except people kind of accept that the Linus tree is the central Linux uh, repository. Um, but Git also supports having centralized repositories. Git.debian.org and Anya, for instance, gives us that ability. And so far, I, my experience with Git is very limited, but so far I haven't really seen a project except the Linux kernel that does it in a distributed fashion. So, uh, so far it's all been centralized. But uh, let me get back to that example I promised a little earlier to show why and how the CVS-like version control systems fail when you talk about branching. And what's happening here is that on the top we have a series of commits. That's basically the upstream branch. And then uh, I branch two feature branches of that. F1 and F2. F1 does some development and F2 starts. And in F2, I realized that in order to be able to implement the feature that I wanted to implement, I have to have one of the changes that has been implemented as part of F1. So I pull that dark blue change, I pull it into my F2 tree, and the light blue um, circles denote which of these commits actually have the changes that I just pulled in. And F2 is then done, I commit and I merge back into the main line. So actually that, this one should also be blue. And now F1, there's some further development being done on it, and eventually that feature branch is completed, and now we want to merge it back into the main branch. Now if you do this with CVS, you're a maniac. If you do this with SVN, then uh, what's going to happen? Sorry? Well, it's I didn't hear it, but I'll just... Okay, it, it could merge it silently, but SVN unfortunately doesn't do that. Um, well, it depends. It, if, it's, if nothing has changed, then it'll give you that G state, like the, mer the merge has already been part, but that very rarely happens. I'm a member of the uh, clone project, and we use SVN with about a thousand branches all over the place, and it's an absolute catastrophe because SVN will actually say, sorry, the changes that have that you're trying to apply have already been applied. And especially if there's been a number of commits in between and you get the conflict. Uh, if, you, if you use uh, SVN with uh, merge tracking, merge tracking tool, uh, right there, if you use Yeah, SVN is supposed to get merge tracking um, integrated in the main line in 1.5 or something. So it will soon be able to deal with this a lot better, but so far it hasn't. And this is sort of an ecological niche that the distributed version control systems have picked up simply by tracking commits and not snapshots. So what are the features that of version control systems that are actually relevant to Debian? And we think, Manish and I sat down yesterday and we isolated these couple of features. We think that branching and merging um, are trivial with uh, the distributed version control systems. They're so easy and uh, you should just use them. Or once you understand how to use them, just make it become part of your workflow. Um, 
that distributed version control systems can be centralized on ALIA, and if they are, then they're really accessible to contributors. So a contributor who on Friday night doesn't want to go out but stays home and then at two o'clock wants to start hacking and implement a feature in one of the projects hosted on ALIA can actually, with a distributed version control system, just check out the entire repository without having any, any form of account and start hacking the entire weekend with a full featured version control system and commit and so on, and then in the end has something to present which may as well get him an account, but the time delay between applying for and getting the account hasn't really stopped him doing the work. Now I realize that SVK, for instance, is an extension to SVN or is some type of SVN that can do the same, but I'm not really arguing against SVK because it's going in the same direction here. Um, and of course, the no need to track what has been merged where, the merge tracking, which I've uh, been harping about too much now. So uh, it's time for me to actually get rid of these slides and uh, have a little look in the command line. And what I'm going to try to do now is show you how you can take any Debian package and easily convert it. I'm going to use Git and then show you what I mean with these branches and how easy it is to work with them. So, uh, of course, I'm the kind of person that keeps all the valuable stuff for presentations in temp. So, uh, Increase. Yeah. You're making it really difficult because this is Fluxbox and RxVT. I, can someone tell me how to do it? Use no terminal. Out. So, I don't have those installed. Do you know any other fonts except for 10 and 20? and you can configure it and it's really nifty and has defconf integration and translation to like a hundred whatever <laughs> languages, you know, it's a very, very featureful, but not quite new Hello World tool. <coughs> so I'm unpacking it and as you can see, it's a very, very simple upstream tarball here. So what I want to do is really create a branch that has the upstream data in there so that I can just keep checking stuff in there whenever upstream makes any changes. If upstream uses git, I can just clone their git repository, but in this case, upstream doesn't even know what the uh, version control system is. And uh, the changelog actually says that it was done like in the 13th century or something like that. <laughs> so, I'll just simply quickly here uh, initialize this package as a git repository and add all files. And then I can commit this. I'm just not going to do any commit messages for now. And uh, do something like tag. This is upstream 1.1. I think that was enough. Okay, so now upstream is checked in and I can uh, have a look at my list of branches and that's only master. I don't like master, so let's go and uh, rename that one because it is actually the upstream branch. Master turns into upstream. All right. Now I have one branch that is upstream. And now I want to add the Debian directory, which is in the diff file. So I just create a new branch, which I can do with checkout, which then also automatically switches into the new branch and say this is the branch Debian directory. 
And now in that branch Debian directory, if I call git branch, then uh, it'll tell me with an asterisk that we're in the Debian Gear directory. In that branch, I'll just apply a patch. Commit the thing and tag it. Actually, some people have pointed out to me that I don't need to be doing this tagging, but I kind of like it. And uh, one of the features that Manash is going to show you, he's going to do the same stuff that I'm doing with his workflow, and he has an extensive <laughs> set of scripts that help him. Um, one thing that Arch does is you can seal branches. So when a branch is sealed, it, uh, you can't commit to it anymore. You'll get an error message. And conceptually, that's a very nice idea because I have previously, and I'm sure some of you have done the same, been in a branch and committed stuff to that branch, but that branch actually represented the latest stable security update and wasn't your trunk where you're supposed to do your work. So now you have to actually undo that change, port the commit into your trunk, and it's just a lot of work. So if, if you had sealed that branch, then it, nothing could have happened. Now with Git, um, tagging is sort of like the same, um, because I tag a branch at a certain point in time. That means this is actually my released version. And if I now commit to this branch after the tag, um, I can very easily, I, I haven't changed the branch because the tag doesn't move, but I can very easily take that commit and move it <coughs> to the trunk even easier than with all the other version control systems that I know. Okay, so now I checked in my Debian directory and I can basically, at this point in time, build the thing and uh, ship it. But because we actually do have two different branches, and if I look at the um, upstream branch, I wish Git had CO for checkout doesn't do that. If I look at the upstream branch, then the Debian directory is not in there. So one of the things that Manoj, I think, has, has come up with, I'm not entirely sure whether it was your idea, but I learned it from you, um, is the concept of an integration branch. And the integration branch is basically where you pull in all the changes that are supposed to be in the package that you release. So now we, I created this int branch and uh, switched to it as well. And I'll just simply pull in what I want. I'm going to, because this is already branched from upstream, I don't need to check out or merge upstream into this. I'll just simply merge my Debian directory branch. And then I find myself inside the integration branch with basically all patches that I've worked on so far applied. And I can package this, release, tag, be done with it. Now, if I actually wanted to, I have two more concepts that I want to show off, and I, I hope I'm not actually using too much time. Um, two use cases of the ones that Manoj identified earlier on. One of which is upstream releases a new patch, or it creates a new version. And the other one is that I'm actually hacking on a local extension, or I'm fixing a bug, or something like that. So let's assume, um, for instance, that Debian policy has changed and requires me to install the software in a different place than upstream has been doing. So far it's all worked okay, but now the policy change is telling me I have to do something else. So what I can do is I can create yet another branch. Um, the policy change branch. And just notice, I mean, uh, Gravity, David Nuzinov, the other day had a, a talk about Git and he was all hyper about these branches and I'm all hyper about these branches because they're so easy to do so fast to switch and uh, you can throw them away and it's really, there's really no reason not to use them. So now I'm in this policy change branch and I'm just simply going to make this uh, important policy change. I wish I could... Can you hear me? No. Dang it. Um, is my legs going to fall off very soon if I continue like this? Okay, let's make this important change here, yeah? This is the important change that policy requires. All shell scripts now have to end with a common X. 
We have a new policy team. Come in. We have a new policy team. All right, all right. New, new policy dictates coming. Yeah, and if you want it to be machine interpretable, you have to talk to Mama. <laughs> so minus A just simply says, take all the changes I've made. Usually Git has that staging area, which uh, it exposes, but uh, I don't really care about that right now. So now I've created a commit. I am actually in my policy change branch. If I now switch back to the integration branch, for instance, because I want to be publishing 1.1-2, so I can fix that grave bug because of policy non-compliant. Um, of course, that change is not in here. You see that in the policy non-conforming shell script because it doesn't end with an X. So now, preparing the next release, all I can do, all I have to do, is just simply say, hey, merge the policy change in here. And so far, I guess that's not magic to anyone of you. I mean, you've done merges and branching and so on and so forth, but the lovely thing is, I can merge the policy change again. I can make changes to the policy change branch, merge from that one into some other upstream related branch, merge back, add 15 new branches, merge in between, and then pull it all together, and Git will just say, well, okay, those are the commits. You know, you didn't need 32 branches for that because all I had to do was this, but it just doesn't get confused. So it's very nice. So now I have a policy compliant shell script in my integration branch, and I can just uh, package it and be done with it. Now let's see what happens when upstream releases a new version. What are we gonna do? Well, my set of branches, every growing set of branches, includes the upstream branch. <coughs> so I'm going to switch to that one and simulate a change, a very important one, um, that caused upstream to go to version 2.0 or something like that. Um, there are actually tools for various version control systems which provide helpers to do what I'm about to do manually, um, inject or whatever they're called, um, so that you can take a tarball and get all the changes into the directory, which is rather easy to do, right? You just unpack the tarball. But the problem is that files that were in the last version, which are not in the current version, will stay in your repository because tar doesn't actually like delete files it didn't contain in the archive, fortunately. Um, so these helper scripts will actually make things easier for you. Now, I haven't used the git build package here in this demonstration because uh, you kind of want to know what's going on underneath, at least I do. I don't really like these high level helpers that do magic and then when something doesn't work, you don't actually know what it didn't do or what it did do. So upstream has provided a new tarball and as a matter of fact, they have adopted our convention that the changelog now also has to contain a comment with an X in it. And uh, Yeah, definitely. No, it is 2.0 because we're also fixing those dreaded fascisms. <laughs> <laughs> Fix it. <laughs> okay, so I can have a quick look here at uh, what Upstream actually did. I mean, now, now it is almost as if I had just unpacked the Upstream's tarball over my existing data. So git status will tell me that the change log and the file, the main file, has changed. I can use git diff and so on and so forth. You've all used this stuff. So I'll just accept the fact that upstream has uh, done some major work on this package. And uh, I'll commit and I'll tag just so that I have a point of reference, an easy point of reference <coughs> later. Oh yeah, we said 2.0. Okay. okay. So what should I do now, given that if I change to my integration branch, then we're still shipping fascisms and uh, old, not 2.0 type data. Um, there are various ways in which one could go ahead now. One of them 
is keeping this integration branch running. That means now I merge all the changes that Upstream has done into my integration branch. I tag it after I release the new package. And I just basically have one <coughs> integration branch that runs alongside the Upstream and simply pulls in all the changes that I need at all points in time. That's definitely one way of doing it. And several people like that because the integration branch the integration branch contains the entire history of the Debian package. However, sometimes it doesn't really make sense to merge upstream changes into the integration branch sort of over the stuff, over the changes that you have made for this package. So in the integration branch are your fixes, your policy fixes, and maybe even fixes affecting the data that is not in the Debian directory. Now, if you pull in from upstream, that means you're sort of giving upstream priority. Wait, the other way around. You're giving yourself priority because... Okay, so I'll just skip it then. All right, just for completeness, the other way, instead of keeping a long living integration branch, would be simply to say, fine, integration branch is done now, I'm going to create a new integration dash 2.0 branch. And then you would have two separate branches. It's nice when upstream changes a lot, then you might actually want to have a separate branch because you can't, there is no real history between 1.1 and 2.0, but uh, it's not always needed. So in this case, I'll just stay with a simple example and uh, I'll just merge upstream's changes into my integration branch and I'm done with it. So I guess I have many, many, are you, are you done? Are you ready to go on again? All right, I guess I have many, many more things to show you, and I spent at least four hours yesterday actually trying to work out the TypeScript that I could show up here. Now, of course, I didn't actually use that TypeScript because I don't know where I put it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if I do find it, oh, one minute, Steiner. If I do find it, um, I shall make it public because it has a lot more examples and like, comments in it of why I do certain things. And it also talks about uh, rebasing, which uh, is a feature that Git users seem to like or hate and aren't really sure about. And I haven't made up my mind, but uh, it's something you might want to think about. And I'm not going to be the one to explain to you how it works. But uh, I hope I've shown pretty much everything that what I've been doing here. Maybe one last thing. Because um, so far, it's just been punching in a couple of commands. And maybe it isn't clear to each one of you what the benefit of all of this is. Especially because there are tools like Dpatch and Quilt, which can also maintain patches. One of the nice things, um, I'm, I'm almost done. Let's go back to my the policy change branch here, and uh, because that was actually created before Upstream released that fancy new 2.0 release, uh, let's merge back the, all the Upstream changes. I could merge, I could rebase, people fight about that. Um, and then, let's say I want to have that policy change actually integrated in upstream. Well, that, in that case, I want a diff, right? Now, Git actually makes it really easy to get diffs between different commits because we actually, it doesn't really differentiate between branches and tags and commit IDs. So, when I say, what's the difference between upstream and my policy change branch. Well, it's not supposed to show everything. I must have done something wrong. I probably uh, merged, I probably branched the uh, change of the integration branch or something like that? Or the one where, yeah, uh, try it, you know? Sit down here, hold the microphone and type. It's <laughs> great. Um, but you can actually really easily create these steps <laughs> between different branches, between the upstream branch and a, a feature branch that you've created. And 
yes, deep patch and quilt can be used to do exactly the same thing. And as a matter of fact, many people have argued that deep patch is so much more accessible, or quilt is so much more accessible, because you actually have the patches as separate files in the file system. If you don't know the package, you just go there, you see a series of patches. That seems to be a lot more accessible than having to understand Git and like trying to get it to list out all the branches and then trying to figure out what these branches actually are. Um, there is something to be said for that, but on the other hand, how many of you have uh, used dpatch and or quilt and have had a new upstream release that required you to go and uh, edit every single one of your patches because upstream has made a trivial change? How many of you are using dpatch and quilt and have not ever done that? You guys must be doing something right, which I'm not. <laughs> All right. The, the benefit of using Git here is that Git can actually just merge across. It has really, really powerful merge abilities, just like most of the other um, distributed version control systems, because they are made for merging. And they will actually track the differences between the current version <coughs> and, uh, and your feature branch without having to be statically encoded in a file that couldn't change because it's actually computed when you call git dip and it's not static in fun. All right, well that's, uh, that's it from me. Are they, did you ask your question, Stan? Met a kind of deleted and a concept in my film for which is a sloppy branch. A sloppy branch is a throwaway branch that I use for hacking and for testing. And uh, so if you needed to make a change, you make it in a sloppy branch, you make sure it works, and then you take a change set, the current change set that you work on, and feed it back to the feature branch or the Debian packaging that you originally, where it's supposed to go. Uh, the sloppy branch is where if things go kablooey, you can just throw it away and rethink what we are doing. Okay, that, that, that's more or less answer my question, number one. Number two is, what do you do about the Debian change log? What did I? What do you do about the Debian change log? I mean, merging it works really poor in most of these systems because they don't understand the system. Um, do you mean in terms of like, how do I fill it out, or what do I yeah, write in there, or how do I merge it? Oh, oh, like, what, where do you commit your changes to the change log? Um, well, to be honest, uh, I'm not really using this workflow that much yet, so I can't, <laughs> <laughs> I can't give you, uh, I, I've thought about it a lot, but I can't really give you a, a, a clear answer on that. There are more, Rather you can, Yeah, we, we have to deal with this a lot, because we have teammates take stuff in Git right now, and Git really, it's pretty magical to merge stuff, but in terms of change logs, it doesn't. Like if Julie will commit something, then I commit something on a branch. I try and merge it from experimental to unstable. It becomes messy. You still have to undo the change log by hand. I don't see that there's any current good way around it for the to merge tools yet. It does a reasonable job, but it's not perfect. It's still okay. There's the tools like Dev Commit, which uh, I find very helpful, and uh, I've actually written uh, my own, even for a uh, back when I was trying to get all the SOAP maintainers to use Arch, um, written a little tool that would, whenever there was a new upstream release, then right into the change log, which branches would be obsoleted by that upstream release. Um, so these kind of integration, that, that kind of integration is possible, but on the other hand, I think I keep pretty much everything in Debian change log and then generate my commit messages with that commit from there. But it works for me, I don't, I'm not sure about it. It's horrible for lock check, but other than that. Yeah, as we're talking about Debian packages, uh, how does the generated source package look like? Is it just the um, original tarball and then a very big and ugly disk GZ? Or do you have branches exported in any way so that uh, the users or the interviewer or whatever can use the benefits? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting uh, question. Um, basically, the, the, the way that things are done, if you do it 
in this way and then use the, the standard TPK G dash source minus B stuff to build your source package, then what you will get is the original tarball if you made it and uh, and a div that merged every single feature branch into one. Um, it would be nice to keep these separate and uh, there are various ways of doing it. Uh, D package 2 is supposed to give you the ability to have uh, subdirectories and one of these subdirectories could be just your git directory repacked and then you would have the entire history in the Debian source package. I actually like that a lot. Um, the other the other uh, approach to this problem is uh, HCT, right? the canonical people, they started to create something called the hypothetical change tool, change set tool, and uh, it, it basically does exactly that. They use the feature branches a lot, I think they use pretty much exactly Monarch's model, and uh, then generate separate patches for each one of them, and actually then have them as deep patches in the source package. So. Uh, I'm sure there could be a much cleaner implementation of all of this, but uh, so far we have what we have, and that's what we have to work with, I guess. Yeah. Totally doing that with Quill hasn't done yet. Right. Yeah. So another question, you want him? I, one problem that I always have when working with um, any kind of original control system and heavy packages is that the handling of the upstream tables that should be identical and kept around everywhere, um, is somehow not integrated. You have to manually put in the directory, if you, someone else pulls the, the repository, has to somehow get the tablet himself. Any suggestions? Yeah, the, the problem is if you, even if you tag upstream and you, all, you don't make any changes, the tarball is going to be different every single time you do it because of all this meta information that it stores. So uh, the, the way that I've been doing it is that Yes, you need to have a central repository of your tarballs. And uh, I try to use the Debian archive as much as possible for that. So I just basically obtain the tarball from the Debian archive if it's there, if I'm doing a Debian revision. <coughs> if not, then uh, I'm about to upload it, and then it can just stay in the parent directory. That's one solution. Steiner? Don't, don't you can't that. HTTP is actually supposed to solve this. They usually have some really, really good open magic for generating the same tarballs every time. I've been told. Blame stop. Can you say that again? Just sorry. HTTP is supposed to be able to recreate the original same bit exact horrible every time. I don't know how they do it. Blame stop. How do you handle time stamp? Uh, how do you handle time stamp? I have no idea. Ask stop. I think I don't. Um, there's a question there. Then uh, I think Manush. Can we do the question session later? Because some okay. of the questions that have been asked. Do you mind if we uh, postpone your question until later? Sure, reply to what he was saying. Then uh, let's make that the last one. So it's really ugly, but um, the, what, what the Kerberos packaging team, what we do is we just check the upstream tarball directly into SDK. You get you blow your repository with all the upstream tarballs, but it means that everyone working from your revision control repository has them. I'll, some of the things that Martin touched on, I'll be explaining in a little bit more detail in the next slide. Uh, going with the structure. So Martin kind of showed you the workflow kind of based on what I started off with. Uh, I'm going to give you some context. I'll do this, what he did later with Arch, but I don't know how interesting that is. I bought a, shell script that I essentially did line by line. I can make it available online, you, can, you guys can do this. Um, so, one of the things that is missing from the old uh, version control systems and uh, patch-based systems is, firstly, decent handling of directory and file name renaming. If I have a file, in one branch, somebody makes a copy of this branch, creates a new directory, moves my file, file there and calls it by another name, and makes some improvements to it. When I drag these changes back, I want those improvements going to my file in the original directory under the original name. I uh, fail to see how patch and quilt can readily handle that back and forth. 
between different, different poetry. Secondly, I would also, I like the fact that uh, if I make changes to the permissions of the file, make it an executable or non-executable, and go back and forth, I would like this change to be also represented in my version control system. Uh, again, CBS didn't actually care what, if your, whatever permissions it, your file used to have when it initially checked in, was it. You couldn't go back and forth. Uh, another useful feature that I find in having, uh, especially if you're using a real honest to goodness distributed workflow where there are a bunch of you in, in a team who are all collaborating on a package is the ability to sign my branch or my repository and not have the signatures be invalidated by a change in the future. Any version control system that relies on having one file in which all revision information for one a file or a directory goes into, like RCS and CBS used to have the comma V files. Every time they did a new revision, they added a junk onto the end of the comma V file which means the signature was lost. So, um, how, do I, how does my workflow deal with Debian packages? Well, first, I like to have a separate category inside my repository. Let me define two terms. Arch has a repository. A repository is a collection of uh, categories. Where a category is what you would think of as the name of the software. So a category is a package name in Debian parlance. A repository is a chunk of uh, disk which contains a history of all the packages in there from the start of the repository until you decide to steal it and finish it and move on. I generally have one repository for Debian release. I had a edge repository, now I'm currently using the Lenny repository. In the tutorial section to follow, I have created a brand new repository called DevCon 7. Uh, so I would like to have one category for package. Oh, wrong laptop. Uh, I create a bunch of branches. Like Martin explained, there is one branch from upstream. The only thing that goes in there is stuff that upstream injects in. Uh, there is one branch for every downstream distinct feature. So if you're uh, following somebody's patches, there's a branch for it. If you're hacking up something new, there's a branch for it. Uh, there's also things that we do for Debian, which are not really meant to be said that. They are usually small little things. We're like changing path names. I'm saying that don't install by default in user local, install in slash user. Uh, the changes that we make to make sure that everything configurable lives in slash etc. Stuff like that goes in the Debian branch. There's an integration branch where everything comes together. So if you've got a bunch of different packages, the first time it hits your floppy branch or integration branch is when you know if these two path sets actually are compatible or if something has to be changed in order to uh, make them work together. You can either make the changes back in one of the two path sets, or you can create a yet another branch that fixes up the fallout from integrating either one of those uh, distinct patches into your uh, development branch. I've already talked about the sloppy branch as in testing. One of the reasons I like doing it this way, as opposed to having bunches of patches that you apply on the fly, Every one of these branches can be built individually. So you can build straight out from the repository. Anybody can grab that, build this, and make sure that the upstream feature set or the upstream behavior is just so. Every patch that is applied, you can build that branch straight out of the repo. Go there, do a HTTP get or something, and you can get the whole branch, build it, and see how the behavior changes. 
this is not something that you get when you have got original source, 50 different patches that are applied and the only thing anybody ever really gets is what you get in the end. This way, if I have to feed back patches to upstream, I can say, look, this is in my relation to everything else that I'm doing. Here is this one feature I have implemented. Here is a clean patch against the most recent upload that we have done. And this is what it does. And it has been tested by me. People like clean patches. They don't want to get one patch that implements 30 different features. All my dot slash Debian directories are branches of a common parent branch. This makes it really simple for me to do things that policy requires me to change. For example, even the policy doesn't quite require you to have MD5 some through your package. I decided at some point to start doing that. All I had to do was implement it in the parent of all these dot slash Debian directories, run one command, a little shell command that says for replay that change in every single Debian directory of the 34 packages, source packages I maintain. I went away, came back from coffee, and it was all signed, sealed, and uploaded to the repository. I didn't have to do anything manually. That by itself is, for me, another justification for having composing my Debian packaging as if it's upstream and dot slash Debian as the pledge. Uh, category. I also found that I had a whole bunch of things which were in common in my daughter Debian directory. Stuff on how to, what the target dependencies are, or how to handle things like automate or uh, translations and stuff. So instead of replicating it all over the place, I did what we all do. We, I abstracted it away created a separate category, and now it's there in common. If I ever want to make changes, there's only one place I have to go to. OK. Uh, here we get to the dreary part of the slides. I'm going to show what Martin did using art. I'm assuming that since Arch is no longer hip and fashionable, very few people here actually know how to get started using Arch. Uh, since this is a workshop, I thought there was a remote possibility that one or two people might want to play along. So this is how you set up a local Arch repository that you don't need a network connection for. Just change my username for yours. And uh, ah, the how my checked out tree lies. I have a special package which is what uh, which is called packages. It has a branch called Debian. So in Arch parlance, it is packages dash dash Debian dash dash one point zero. That contains the directory structure, which uh, is how I build packages. Uh, it contains one top-level directory for every package I have. It contains a config directory, which has a subdirectory for every package I have. The config directory tells you how to uh, grab all the bits and pieces to create a build buildable tree. So it has my integration branch. It has dot slash Debian from another place, dot slash Debian from common from another place. And the config file directly makes sure that no end user ever has to deal with all this stuff. And I think this is where I get to. Okay. So, what are the steps that I do for initial initial? I got a fireball from upstream. I untie it. It gets into, unpacked into a directory. I change the directory name to be something that I like as opposed to something that upstream like. I tell Arch to initialize this tree to become an Arch repository, and then I import it. I've got my upstream branch. I run something, I just say TLA tag upstream branch 
something else, feature A, feature B, Debian, or whatever. So I just, these are things that take seconds to execute. They're simple as TLA, tag, source, destination. I create all my branches, and I think that's very similar to what Martin showed you in Git. This is where the uh, things start getting fun. Every single branch that I have right now is identical. But I need to tell my integration branch that don't do whatever was just done to create this initial version of the branch, because the integration branch already contains all the code. So I do not need, say, if I have five branches, I don't want to merge five versions of the import in my integration branch. Arch has a nice little thing which says synchronized tree, which basically says pretend that you already So it just grabs the metadata. It grabs all the change logs, it grabs when it was done, who it was done by. And it puts it into the patch history. Everything in Arch is based on patch history, so now as far as Arch is concerned, you had merged everything in. I already talked about how you need to compose your build tree. So the, actually, are there any questions? I'm, I'm kind of galloping through this material and I see eyes glazing over. I can go back to my laptop and I can show you, you know, but unlike Martin, I've got all these things so I can just cut and paste. So I don't have to type in all the command lines. Uh, should we take a breath? I use TLA or BIOS interchangeably. Uh, I, it depends on what my fingers do. There are some commands in TLA that I use TLA, my fingers automatically type in TLA. There are other commands where my fingers type in BIOS. I have, I can see no logical rationale that my fingers are using to choose either TLA or BIOS. So I'm kind of at the mercy of the logic or the lack of logic of my finger right there. So far, they're being perfect drop-in replacements for each other. So you get grab anything from set and it ought to work. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I think I'll skip the tedium of going in and typing things in command line for a little bit longer. I'll tell you about why I selected Arch as opposed to going to the newfangled things like Git or Mercurial or... Arch is massively scriptable. So, for example, every time somebody comes up with a new major version release, Arch has, I, I told you, three components. There is category, which is the name of the project, there's branch, which is which branch you're talking about, upstream, demo, feature A, feature B. And then there is a, a, a version. So I like to change the version of my art uh, repository, uh, the package repository every time a new version, uh, upstream version comes out. Some upstreams which don't release major upstreams more than once or twice a decade, Emacs. I go to the minor version. I change whenever they change their minor versions. If you've got 15 branches, it is quite tedious to make sure that you have done the fifth, made sure that you don't miss any branch, got them all to the new version, make sure that the, your integration branch knows that it shouldn't try to incorporate code changes because there were no code changes. All I need to do is I just say arch new branch version, package name, new version name, then I go away. It goes off by itself. 
not only does it create a new set of branches for me, it goes to where my working tree and renames the directory names and makes sure that I have got the latest version, you know, with the new version name and everything, all sitting there and waiting for me. I also have a printable agent running. I know, it's weak security, but hey. Uh, Printable agent makes sure that I don't have to be present for it to sign each and every branch. So I can just go away, come back 15 minutes later, and it's all ready for me to start hacking. If it was not a major version release, I don't have to do the arch new version. I continue working the wrong laptop again. Then I unpack the New York Stream 3, and there is this neat little tool called BAS Load DIR. There is an equivalent one called TMA Load DIR. And I believe it has made its way into DAX and SVN and so on. What the X underscore load DIR says is you give it, sit in the upstream branch, give it the name of the new unpacked tree. It makes sure that the latest upstream version is what your branch now uh, exactly mirrors. The bars load DIR has this neat thing of tracking file name changes. So if a if file finds that a file name that used to be present has disappeared and there's a new file name and it may be in a different directory, it puts it up and asks you, is this a totally new file or is it just a rename? So history is preserved even if upstream changed the file name. And I don't have to do anything about it. it goes and looks at um, sizes and makes heuristic guesses and so on. And then you try to check if upstream has actually broken anything that you did. So I create a new uh, sloppy branch. I copy my previous integration branch in there. I recreate the change set that just happened with this new upstream branch. In my experience, for my packages, 95% of the cases, nothing breaks. All the change set from one stream applies cleanly into my uh, integration branch. In cases where it doesn't, then I have some more work to do. I've got to identify which particular patch it broke, and then decide how I am to fix that. So using this workflow doesn't actually work magic. If there are incompatible changes upstream, you st a human still has to come in and decide how to fix that. Now assume that everything is okay, just for this, because it usually is. Then I have a little script that calls arch upgrade. What it does is it goes into every single one of my branches finds out what are the patches missing from the upstream branch, and it applies all the patches in sequence that have not been incorporated. If in some cases I want to cherry pick and not pick something from the upstream, I would already have told I by, you know, pretending to have that patch already. So it goes and grabs upstream patches, applies it all across my branches, commits them, goes to my integration branch, applies the upstream change set directly, and then tells us to pretend that all the other branches have been synchronized. And again, I can just say arch upgrade, go away, have coffee, come back, and upstream changes have all been incorporated, and I didn't have to spend a second dealing with detach or quilt or what have you, even if there are points, the patch would have a point if things have moved around a few lines or something. I have had to work with packages that use D patch and quit when I was applying the serial exchanges. I can't for the life of me imagine how people manage to go through so much tedium every time there's a little change. Why are you saying space between N and G? 
Okay. Now I have, you've got to, you know, you've got to update the change log because the New York Stream version is coming. You may need to do some other little things, uh, control file if the dependencies have changed or whatever. And then I commit. The neat thing about this is the comment hooks. I've got things like arch create config, which goes on, figures out how many branches I have in my build tree. It also looks at my upstream directory, figures out how many branches I have and what is the latest batch set for each of the branches, grabs all this information, puts it in a file in the config directory. So anybody can just say, uh, create, uh, get me a replicate Manoj's directory structure for this particular package at such and such a version, the, you know, the version that he just uploaded. And I will happily look at his config file and reproduce my directory structure on your machine. You don't have to ever worry about how many branches I had and how they nest with each other. All you need, actually you don't even need the config file, but if you have the config file, you can do that. And actually you don't even need the config file, which is even easier than that. Because the next thing it does is it creates a grab file. A grab file is a, something that can be dumped on the web, or any URI. And you can give this URI to Arch. You can just say Arch, go to HTTP, arch.debian.org slash arch private to arch and blah blah and there's a grab file and it will pull in all these things it will set up the build layout i talked about it will grab all the sources and mind you not all the sources that are mentioned in my config file might be from my repository it could be from russ's repository from his tree of the debian policy order i can grab sources from wherever the original authors are. If somebody else is creating, maintaining that set, I can point directly to this repository. You just point out straight, it will grab so sources from all over the place, and you are good to go. Finally, I, there is a script called arch export that goes in, looks at the whole nested tree. For It walks down the tree, and at the top of every arch package, it runs arch export, which you know cleans out the dot slash arch directories and arch id directories, and from that point on, you know you run pbuilder or whatever build process you have for taking a clean Debian source uh, layout and go from there. Um, I don't have a specific place where I keep upstream storage tarballs. I just keep them in my build tree and I keep a local copy and disk is cheap so I've got everything that I have ever built and uploaded over for the last five years sitting on my development machine so I can always go back and check. And I think this is where my prepared slide said. Now, I can go through and demonstrate what I've talked about in you know, high level view and I can show you the command line uh, that you need to use if there is any interest in this. Or else I can open the floor for questions. Well, we, can have, uh, we can also, if some people just wanted to uh, try it, um, and be around and uh, answer questions if you're interested in, or if you are not sure how to do a certain concept if it's your first time. Well, are there any? There's a question. Is, is there a similar exporting tool for Git to get upcoming uh, um, directory? I'm almost sure there's Git export. Um, it has Git clean, which cleans your entire directory, um, except for the .git directory, but. Uh, export command exists for Git as well. So far I've seen it in every version control system. So I think the, the main thing about the Arch workflow that I didn't entirely understand is the bit about telling branches that behave as if uh, patches had already been applied when they're not actually being applied. 
applied to them. Could you I, go over that a little bit more? Because I think I got a little bit lost somewhere in the explanation of that. I, I, I'm not too sure. This is what the usage says. So if I have got a new upstream version that came in, and I applied it to, say, feature branch A, so the up, upstream changes have gone to feature branch A. I applied it directly into my uh, integration branch already, because I did that in the sloppy branch and made sure it worked. So now I have got all the code that came in in the new upstream version both in my feature set branch A and also in my integration branch. But at some point, if I make hack some changes into my feature branch, I would like to import those changes into my integration branch. If I just said that merge from my feature branch A, it would try to add in this upstream code, which is already in my feature branch again. So you use TLA sync tree and give it the feature branches patch number so that I already have that code. Would you please just go and get the patch log from that branch and add it in so my history is complete? Once you have your patch log in the integration branch, every any time you want to merge it in, Arch knows that you know that version exists because you have the patch log there. Can't you identify the fact that the revisions that you've merged independently into two different branches are in fact the same revisions and figure this out for itself? This is how you tell it that they are the same revision. I, I don't think uh, you may not be understanding exactly what's going on. The uh, what what any git has exactly the same command as called git fetch, and what happens is that in the meta directory, um, arch and git keep a track of all the patches that have been applied, all the commits. And every single every single commit is a file and uh, an, ob an object in Git, but it doesn't really matter. And what this uh, sync archive, I think, or whatever sync tree, sync tree um, does, and what Git fetch does, is that it simply pulls in all the changes, but only the metadata of it, so that you actually know about the changes. You can diff against them. You can uh, look at the logs of someone else's changes but your local source tree hasn't changed at all. So now what you can do is, if you, if you wanted to be uh, masochistic about it, you could like iterate through every single change that upstream has made, look at the log file and say, yeah, I like that change, and then say, merge only that change, without ever having to go to the upstream repository, because you have already pulled all the data that you need to bring your local tree to the same revision as the upstream in your meta directory but it's not applied in the working directory. So, and, and that's kept track of in the version control system. It knows that it, it has those, those patches available and it knows that it has to apply them to that branch. Yeah, it knows that they're available. Um, I'm not entirely sure. It, I think it knows that they've even been applied. All you need to do is look at uh, dot arch directory at the top of your uh, project tree. Inside that, you will see that uh, it has subdirectories that corresponds to each of the repositories you have pulled stuff from. You follow the thing far enough down, and you will see every single patch log that it knows about. So, and that is how, when you run arch, it goes and looks in your dot arch directory to figure out what you already have. I'm perfectly happy to go through and. I have renamed uh, the example that Martin used because I can't pronounce whatever <laughs> packaging you are using in German. It, it is not pronounced as it is written. <coughs> so uh, I have this college hello world. And uh, I can lead you through how I will set this up. <laughs> All right. Can people hear me or does it need to be worried? So this is 
my that's where I usual local store at. This is the top of my tree. I have this Martin's uh, two tar balls sitting here. Packages Debian is where I do my building. So let's see the two packages Debian. I have recreated a directory for Hello World because I knew that I was gonna be working here, but the directory is empty. So I could have created it here. I go back and let's look at my cheat sheet. So the first thing that I'm going to do is copy my upstream tarball. Uh, copy. So now I've got the upstream tarball sitting at the root of my hello world package. Okay. I go to upstream and say tar and again it names it something that I can't pronounce. So the first one of the major problems with getting art integrated into the rest of the uh, mindset, or I Martin said this is the problem of getting art diffused into the developer community. It has two darn many dashes that you need to type. So this is my upstream hardware. Nothing will happen here. The first thing that I need to do is I need to tell Arch that I'm going to be importing this package. So I said set up the archive. The archive name is what I specified. And uh, at this point, no code has been put into the repository. It has just recorded the fact that a, a software whose fully qualified name in the Arch universe is going to be, you know, you see my email address, <coughs> it is uh, the repository is for Devcon 7, which is going to be thrown away as soon as I get back home. And this is the full, fully qualified name in this namespace. The next step is to tell Arch that uh, this particular directory tree that we're sitting in is actually the initial tree for my package. So there it goes. And then if I do a lint, it just means that you've got these bunches of files sitting around here, which would normally be sources, but you haven't told me that they are source files yet. So, if I do ta length minus three, tell me what only files which are untagged, it will give me this, which allows me to do neat things like t i add if I can type correctly. I run the TLA length thing again and there are no problems because the TLA add stuff took the output of the other TLA command and added all those files to it. You could never do this in CVS. And I have been using CVS since it was a C shell script. How many people knew that CVS used to be a C shell script before a bunch of us jumped on the authors that he used next and made them change it to a K shell? Okay, at least one person, I'm surprised. Part of the problem with CVS is I think that it started as a C shell script. I never actually lost that. Okay. I talked about how TLA uh, or ART uses the logs as the primary way of keeping track. The logs contain a whole lot of metadata. So the first thing that you ever do before importing 
is intended to make a law. Okay. In order not to shock people with Emacs, <laughs> I'm going to use a more backward editor to edit this file. People also hate the fact that uh, Arc uses pluses and other strange symbols in its file names. The way that Arc does its logs is supposed to be like an email message. It encourages you to write long emails, like commit messages. So you people, I've seen people write a couple of pages of rants and comments and tell little stories about their new feature, writing commit messages. However, since I'm using AI, VI, big log file now here and I can just say if I spell it right ah since I'm not running in X because I can't run in X and show you all these things my principal agent I'm just going to switch into X, do the first, come back. <coughs> you know, if I hadn't done an aptitude update last night, I could have shown you all this thing to you in glory effect. <laughs> So I just imported it. I the fail import is recorded here like that. Do you think I really need to type in all this stuff? I mean nobody actually cares as long as I show you that these commands actually do work. What you care more about is what the commands are, really, and what it looks like to do them. So I just did this TLA import part. The next thing I would, I would do is go one. I've got this hello world upstream, that's the only thing I have. And so what I'm going to do is there are these bunches of There are four tag commands. I'm going to create four branches and I'm going to check out 
all these four branches. And I'm going to do this in one go. And just one out. Just uh, quickly, maybe you should make it uh, explicit that tag in Arch is the same as branch. They're absolutely treated the same. So when I was tagging previously, I was not creating branches in Git. But uh, when he does PLA tag, that's actually a branch. As Martin said. <laughs> As Martin said, that, all right. Actually, this is, uh, was confusing to me too. I didn't know how to make branches. And if you use bars, you can actually say bars branch, which is an alias for tag. So my fingers, unfortunately, go to TLA because these are early things that I did. All right, let's go to the demo branch. And then I can say, see, now I can just want to use bias. So at this point, everything is identical. I have made no comments on any of the branches. If there were any changes, I could just have done replace here. Um, bias get, which is the same as git get, and I now have this brand new directory here. I create my Debian directory here. Since I don't actually have a skilled in Debian directory, I'll just create one from scratch. And I'm in the proper Debian state, which is a dot slash Debian. That this Debian directory is going to be something for who greater than change log equals bar greater than rule TLA add rules and change log TLA commit and final L. And again, I've got to go into my little X thing in order to run the critical agent uh, Okay, that's not easy if you just turn off the signing for now. Maybe it's easier, better for people to see how you hack these things. When you think when art is trying to do things that you don't want it to do, then thankfully because all their uh, archives are local, 
you can do a other one and R to print T I R uh, I want hello world and go away please. I was getting tired of this too. <laughs> the dips that you get out of this, the, the, the dip.gz that is part of the source package that gets uploaded, doesn't actually have anything in it that would make it evident that it's an arch generated dip. It's just a straight dip from, from the upstream tarball. Is that correct? That is true if you're using arch export. I used to not use arch export, and then it would be a honest to goodness check out of an arch tree and you could run your own arch dip between whatever versions you wanted, uh, assuming you had a network connection. But right now, if you use arch export as recommended by the FTP masters who lagged with me a couple of times, uh, it is one giant dip against uh, upstream origin. Okay, well I had some questions about that giant upstream dip. Suppose somebody comes along and needs to make a change to your package, an NMU from security, or you get hit by a bus while carrying your laptop and all of your arch repositories disappear. Uh, you hold on a second. My arch repository, defined repository, have a mirror on arch.bin.org. Every time I make a commit, they go to uh, my server, which is in Texas, and they also go to this uh, arch.bin.org. So if I get hit by a bus, but while carrying my laptop, you won't get to lose anything. But okay, well, suppose you're all ignorant of where you put all your, your backups, and somebody goes and makes a patch anyway against this unified dip. Right. Uh, well, if you go, I have tried to provide pointers. You go to the uh, P, the package tracking system. Mm -hmm. You will see that there is a little link there which gives you. There are two links. One is for the browser. You can browse every single thing in all my repositories. Or there is a second link that gives you a graph file. You point Arch to that graph file. It will download the sources for you. You don't need to know Arch. You just say TLA URL. And it will go run around, do things, and it will give you the, all the different branches in a stream, which are just full directory trees. And all you need is less and CD and Vim or something better maybe. And you can go and browse the sources. Sure, the one big dip is not itself useful if you want to make changes and you don't know where, you know, which feature set it belongs to or where it should go. Well, I have some thoughts about that giant dip to try to make it perhaps a little more useful. Could you go through and instead of generating one giant dip, use your history of commits to generate each small dip and then concatenate them all together with a comment between each one to which, to which repository which commit actually came from? There are a couple of problems with that. First of all is the ordering in which the things are applied. Uh, I don't actually have to worry about which order things are done in my workflow because they are all separate branches and I just do change it. Uh, if you actually wanted to create a series of patches, then you want to figure out which order patches are applied in in order not to have uh, you know, patch scheme at you. And uh, secondly, there are some things. All right, that is my personal bias, and I guess it doesn't apply generally. Well, that was basically it. I was just a little worried about these giant roll of dips that might be very difficult. Well, I, I suspect that anybody who wants to take over my packages, their first obstacle would be understanding my rules file. Understanding <laughs> art is the least of the problems. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen those. <laughs> Thank you. 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 
yeah, we have to pick up, and uh, I guess the country, we can do the discussion afterwards. Is this room occupied? Yes, uh, Mako will be in here, and uh, yeah, find us. And there's one last announcement I want to make. Um, I did pull up a mailing list, uh, which is called BCS PKG, <laughs> basically trying to. Uh, unite all the people who are using version control for, for packaging. So far it's a dead list, there's not really much going on, but I do have some people already on there from uh, Gentoo and Fedora as well, um, because they're basically facing exactly the same problems as we are. If uh, you're interested, then um, I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just going to say it out now, because uh, too much, no, whatever, it's too much trouble. It's, it's not yet on any Debian server, so you'll find it on my list server, which is lists.mavduck.net, and then slash, actually you don't have to do anything. That'll get you to the index page, and then you can find vcs-pkg in there. And uh, you know, for, for, for conceptual questions, like how do we do oric.tar.gz's, and how can we better improve diffs, um, I think that would be a good mailing list to get things started. So if you're interested, please subscribe. And then I guess, uh, any other questions before we break off? It lists, lists dot .madduck dot net, and then just hit enter and it'll get you there. At least it used to. <laughs> all right, okay, great. Well, I thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Manoj, for having this talk, and uh, well, if there's any more discussion, then let's go at it out in the hallway track. And other than that, have a good evening. Actually, if anyone wants to talk to me, I'll be up in the lounge hydrating up. So, if you guys have time right now, we can just continue the question session. One floor straight up.